Welcome back, and I'm excited to introduce you to Gary Ridge. Gary Ridge is CEO and chairman of the WD-40 company, and he has been there since 1987, and throughout that time has seen extraordinary economic growth and creating economic value. He has done this principally through creating an extraordinary culture. Welcome, Gary, to our conversation. Hey, Benita, it's a delight to be with you today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. I, I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about how you've created such an extraordinary culture that creates economic value. Yeah, well, thank you. It's, it's simple, not easy, and time is not your friend. But um, there are two things in, in business I think are extremely important. Firstly, you have to have a sound strategy. Where are the opportunities? Where do you want to place your bets? What are the resources you need? Be bold in execution. But being bold in execution means you have to have high will of the people or a highly engaged workforce. And, you know, we describe it as a purpose-driven organization. Imagine a place where you go to work every day, you make a contribution to something bigger than yourself, you learn something new, you're protected and set free by a compelling set of values, and actually you go home happy. That's important to us because happy people create happy families, happy families create happy communities, and happy communities create a happy world, and we need a happy world. And as leaders, we can do that. And during this time, we've done okay. Um, we've uh, about 6 x our revenue, uh, 10 x our market cap. We uh, market and sell our product in 176 countries around the world. So the sun never actually sets on WD-40. And, and how have you created that extraordinary culture? What uh, are the key elements? Well, the first one is being committed to it's all about the people. Um, you know, many organizations don't have cultures where people feel like they belong. And belonging is so important. It's one of the biggest desires we have in life is to belong. Uh, we call ourselves a tribe, not a team. And we call ourselves a tribe because the, the earliest uh, civilization was tribal, a place where uh, people belong, they do meaningful work, that's a place of learning and teaching. Um, we have a compelling set of values. Values are there to to guide people and set them free, which is so important. So we hold people accountable uh, and we are, we are coaches, not lead, not managers. Our job is to identify the play and help people play their best game. And the best coaches never run on the field. So we don't like micromanagement either. Hmm. So you have talked in the past about having a culture that has caring, candor, accountability, and responsibility. And I'm really interested in how you create a caring culture at the same time you're encouraging a diversity of thought and uh, avid discussion. Um, can you share with me how you disagree with others while showing that you care for them? Oh, yeah, with respect and dignity. A care is, you know, one of the, the biggest issues that leader have, leaders have is when their ego eats their empathy instead of their empathy eating their ego. So having a caring culture is not only do, do leaders care about their people, therefore that they applaud them and reward them for doing great work, but they're brave enough to have those redirection conversations. But those conversations are not about ego. They're about what a true coach is. And a true coach is a coach is someone who sees someone's potential and helps them become a better version of themselves. So our you know, times of conversation are really around how do we together become better together? That's excellent. Uh, what about when people disagree and you're in a meeting, there are different subgroups forming. How do you help the group through that kind of decision-making process? Well, you know, disagreement's fine. I mean, I think most people actually disagree because there's not clarity around the information that they have around the subject. You know, I've seen situations where, you know, it's great to ask this question. What do you know that I don't know? What are you seeing that I'm not seeing? And how can you help me see what you see? And if you have a conversation that's based on curiosity, not necessarily blame, then you can bring out that, that conversation. So, you know, there was a great book written called uh, Who Moved My Cheese? There was a follow-on from that book called Out of the Maze. 
And in that, one of the things that are, there are quoted is, why do you believe what you believe? And that's a question I think we should all ask ourselves often. Why do we believe what we believe? And is there really depth in our belief? Brene Brown makes a beautiful statement. She says, in the absence of facts and data, we make up stories. And I think it's those stories that really feed into disagreement. So curiosity, asking questions, it's so important. So you encourage your people to find evidence in the decision-making process. And, and how do you go about doing that? Um, by, again, being able to ask the questions and giving them the freedom to have a point of view. You know, bad leadership, uh, leaders that, and I call them toxic leaders. I, I invented someone called Al, the soul-sucking CEO or the soul-sucking leader. And one of his attributes is he must always be right. The other attribute is he hates feedback. So the three most powerful words I learned in my whole life were I don't know. And by being comfortable with I don't know, but also knowing that the answer is out there. So let's go and find the people that can give us the answers. Hmm. There are a lot of leaders out there who are like Al um, and the soul sucking CEO. And I'm wondering how you help the leaders in your organization move past uh, what society says is success of being right and uh, getting decisions done quickly. Um, and how do you help them move to a more collaborative approach? Well, I think that comes down again to having a compelling set of values in your organization that leadership are aligned with. You know, our number one value is we value doing the right thing. Our number two value is we value creating positive lasting memories in all of our relationships. Now, that doesn't mean you can't have a disagreement, but it does mean that you can treat people with respect and dignity. And I'll give you a little example of a story about how you can do that. You know, I was in a meeting some time ago in our offices and there was someone in that meeting that was not creating positive lasting memories. They were actually having a bad morning. You could feel the, the negative toxins spewing out all over the meeting. Now, there's two ways to address that. The, the, the elder soul sucking CEO leader would probably halt the meeting, reprimand the person in public, you know, would do no good. Or you could do nothing and that would do no good either. But when the meeting ended, I, I said to this person, hey, can we go for a walk? So we walked out of our building and I was looking behind a car and under a tree and in a trash can. And they said, what the hell are you doing? And I said, I'm looking for you. And I said, what do you mean? I said, the you I know and love was not in that room today. What's in getting in your way? What's on your mind? Why are you, why are you not the person we know today? So the values gave me the trigger to be able to have that conversation now, we had a lovely conversation. They'd had a bad morning. You know, all of the things went wrong. At the end of it, we kind of hugged and said, all's well. The other side of that, they went back in and they kind of went to the people that were at the meeting and said, hey, I'm sorry, that wasn't me. And they said, we know it wasn't. What did I observe the next day? People were actually approaching that person and saying, are you okay today? So again, I think leadership is, is, is about, you know, not having your ego drive you, but having empathy and wanting people to be successful. Mm. And, and you approach that situation with curiosity, as you had stated before. I love that. Yes. That's really helpful. Another one of your four points is responsibility. And a big mm -hmm. part of getting that ownership, that getting that engagement is to have ownership in the project that people are working on. But ownership frequently comes with a sense of a need to control the process and to control others. So how do you balance having people engaged have ownership yet not be controlling well um again i love words that describe the desired behaviors and we have a thing in the company that really is the cornerstone of our our responsibility we actually call it the maniac pledge may i share it with you would you please it says i am responsible for taking action asking questions getting answers and making decisions. I won't wait for someone to tell me. If I need to know, I am responsible for asking. I have no right to be offended that I didn't get this sooner. And if I'm doing something others should know about, I am responsible for telling them. So this is the pledge that we all, the leaders take, everybody takes in the company, which is one to say, I'm going to be responsible and here's how. And it's a wonderful, wonderful enabler 
of putting responsibility right where it should be, in the hands and the arms of the people. The people who are closest to the situation. Absolutely. Excellent. And do you find that that really helps them to have a sense of ownership? Oh, without doubt. You know, there's been many, not many, thousands of times where I've heard people in, in, in situations go, hey, maniac pledge, and actually use it as their way of opening the conversation in a non-confrontational, you know, really uh, helpful way. So it sounds to me like there are certain ground rules that you set for your meetings and for how your leaders behave. And do you have uh, training courses that help the leaders walk through that process? Yeah, it's 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 embedded. You know, we we're we're a learning and teaching organization. You know, we call ourselves a tribe, not a team, as I've shared. And the number one responsibility of a tribal leader is to be a learner and a teacher. One of the other pillars. Um, that, that we have is, you know, we have care, candor, accountability, and responsibility. Candor is really important. And mm -hmm. we describe that as no lying, no faking, no hiding. We believe most people don't lie in businesses. What they do do is fake and hide. And Benita, why do they fake and hide? Because of fear. Yeah, and protect. we don't make mistakes. We have learning moments. So we're taking that fear away from... Yeah, be curious, be entrepreneurial. You know, you're going to have learning moments. There's no doubt about it, but let's not treat them as being failures. A learning moment is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that needs to be openly and sharely shared with everyone, not just held back. So it's really important. That's excellent. So Gary, thank you. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with our, our great leaders here at the conference board regarding how they can become more collaborative in their environment? Um, well, I'd like to say number one is we have as leaders the greatest opportunity in the world to make a difference because we touch more people every day. So if we can send people home happy and create a happy world, we've done more than anybody could ever do in the world. And to do that, it's not about you, it's about those you serve, it's not about ego, it's about empathy. It's, it's you being a coach and helping people step in to the best version of their personal self because life's a gift and we don't need to send it back unwrapped. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Gary. Appreciate your time on this. My delight, thank you.